strategist Barry Wood. That's all tomorrow morning uh, from 8 o'clock. And now the half-hour news with Samantha Butler. Australia will have its fifth Prime Minister in eight years after the ruling Liberal Party last night voted out Tony Abbott in favour of long-time rival Malcolm Turnbull. Radio Australia's Eliza Borello reports from Canberra. After securing 54 party room votes to Tony Abbott's 44, Mr Turnbull last night emerged as Australia's next Prime Minister. As there has been a change of Prime Minister, but we are a very, very strong government. Mr Turnbull has promised a more effective, consultative government. He's indicated a reshuffle of the coalition front bench isn't likely until this week's parliamentary sittings are complete. The Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, will be sworn in as his deputy after seeing off a challenge from the Defence Minister, Kevin Andrews, 70 votes to 30. EU ministers meeting in Brussels have failed to reach unanimous agreement on a controversial plan to relocate 120,000 migrants with binding quotas for individual member states. Correspondents say there's enough support to adopt the plan against the wishes of some Central European countries, but the EU will hold further talks in hope of maintaining unity. Luxembourg's Minister of Immigration and Asylum, Jean Esselborn, said a clear majority of countries had agreed to the scheme in principle. A large majority of member states have committed in principle to the additional relocation of a further 120,000 people who deserve international protection as part of these massive migratory flows. The Commission's proposals will serve as the basis for an agreement. The Presidency will consider this work a top priority and we are aiming for adoption at the Council meeting on October the 8th. The European aircraft manufacturer Airbus has opened its first factory in the United States. The BBC's Michelle Fleury reports. Airbus is taking on rival Boeing in its own backyard, opening its first ever facility in America. Being in Alabama allows Airbus to deliver its A320 and A321 planes to its US customers faster. Its first order here is going to American carrier JetBlue. And there's another benefit. Alabama is one of the so-called right-to-work states, where local laws make it difficult for trade unions to operate. It's one of the big reasons manufacturers are attracted to such states. State officials in California say 23,000 people have been driven from their homes by two wildfires in the north of the U.S. state, which is suffering from a severe drought. One person has died and others are reported missing. Forestry and fire officials say there are a dozen fires alight, covering a total area of more than 1,800 square kilometres. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Good morning. Welcome to Bank Chat. I'm Hugh Chiverton. Your co-host today is Karen Ko. Karen, good morning to you. Good morning, Hugh. And welcome back. Thank you. We're talking first today about Jiang Xiaoming's comments on the separation of powers and the role of the chief executive under the basic law. The liaison office director said at the weekend that the chief executive holds a position of authority above the executive, legislature and judicial branches and that Hong Kong was not a system that exercised the separation of powers. That's the practice whereby the different branches have separate and independent powers and areas responsibility, so the powers of one branch are not in conflict with the powers of the other branches. Is he right in interpreting the basic law in this way? Does that make the CE like an emperor? Is there anything new in this? And if not, why is he making this point now? Is he slapping down the pandems or simply stating facts? Email us with your thoughts, questions and comments. Our address, bankchat at rthk.hk. Our Facebook page for discussion, bankchat on rthk radio 3. You can write there or you can call us on 233-88266, 233-88266. After 9.20, we're talking about remedies for child abuse cases in Hong Kong. Join us for the first discussion, we have with us MPC Delegate Peter Wong, Lawrence Ma, who's Chairman of the China-Australia Legal Exchange Foundation, and Edward Chin, who's a, hedge, who's a convener of the 2047 Hong Kong Monitor and a hedge fund manager. Later, also we hope to be joined by Professor Simon Young from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, Peter Wong, maybe we'll start with you. Good morning. Thanks for, morning, for, morning, for, for joining morning, us once again. Yes. Uh, uh, what do you make of what uh, Zhang Xiaoming had to say? Was, it, was, was he right? Do you think... Uh, uh, it's it's true that uh, the chief executive uh, is above the different branches of government and we do not have separation of powers here? 
I think uh, what I gather from uh, uh, Director Zhang is that he merely reiterated and also broadened the explanation of the basic law. I think what he has said is really nothing new. But the thing is, people have, <laughs> I mean, exaggerated uh, its implications. Uh, number one, the, uh, the, uh, it is clearly state in spirit and in essence in the basic law. Hong Kong is, under the basic law, is governed by the executive-led administra- administration government. And it has never been a balance of the three uh, authoritative administrative functions. As uh, so many of the pandemic I heard in the news I talk about, we never have it in the colonial time, and uh, and we, we in in the essence of the basic law, uh, it is clearly spelled out in many of the uh, actually clauses that uh, the uh, executive branch actually leads the the government administration. So that is the Mr. Jones, uh, Director Jones' uh, uh, statement clearly spell out and remind people that actually the, uh, the chief executive has a much more role to play in the, in the basic law than uh, the people uh, uh, understand. So I think now, and, and another point I'd like to point out is that why is that the, Dr. Director Zhang is now making this statement? Because I think simply the way I look at it is that uh, in the past two years, we, we were heavily involved in Occupy Central, the political reform, and the rationale trying to deliberate in the details of uh, the uh, the basic law is is, is, is is fertile because people is only taking political stance and and sometimes miss the really the ration of the basic law. Now, as uh, Director Chung, I think earlier has ex- indicated the the political. <laughs> Uh, aspect of the of the, the reform is 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 is, is the finish, and that he wants to put that down. And I think it's a good time for our community to understand better, deeper, and what we are we are actually uh, living with, and what is the basic law is all about. And the basic law is clearly spelled out that yes, the CE has a, has a very important role to play, and he's accountable not only just for to the SAR. At the same time, uh, he has been accountable. He has to be accountable uh, to the central government. And uh, there are clear uh, outlines in the basic law that governs what he can do and he, what he cannot do. And he can't step out of that. And not as a lot of the statements say that he's like, like an emperor. He can't. <laughs> Okay, uh, Simon Young has joined us, Professor Young from the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. Good morning to you. Good morning. And thanks for joining us. Do you, do you, do you agree with Peter Wong? It does say that the uh, Hong Kong under the basic law is an executive-led system. That's right, isn't it? That's a fact. Well, yeah, we've, we've heard that for a long time. That's correct. Um, but I think when we talk about the executive, it's important to distinguish between the chief executive uh, and the executive authorities. And I think uh, what uh, the recent comments of Mr. Zhang has highlighted is that the chief executive does have a special role. Um, I don't think it's helpful uh, to refer to this in hierarchical terms. I think that's one of the reasons why people have been a bit distressed by uh, what's been said by Mr. Zhang, because uh, it's hard to uh, think of it in terms of one being higher than the other, one authority being higher than the other. I think it's better just to leave it as a special uh, uh, role uh, under the basic law. And in fact, I would characterize this role as a bridging role. And no, no other uh, authority or power uh, uh, in, in the basic law has this special role. It's a power that is meant to bridge the two sides, uh, because the nature of this beast is that uh, there's likely to be diversion between uh, you know, what the central government believes and what the Hong Kong government believes. And the role of the chief executive is to really try to bring both sides together. Uh, and I think that is a special role that needs to be recognized. So, Professor Young, um, a lot of people have said that there's a little bit of a difference between how we interpret um, this this area of the basic law in theory and in practice. I mean, people are saying that, of course, the chief executive is not immune from the law. I mean, do you agree that there's enough clarity about exactly what the chief executive's role is? 
Well, I think all this reference to being an emperor or being immune to the law, I think is real distraction because I think it's completely irrelevant. I don't think Mr. Zhang was saying anything about uh, ob obedience to the law. Um, I mean, I think this is a rule of law society. Everyone has to comply with the law. No one has doubted that at all. Um, I think it, it, it's the configuration of the law that, that, is, that is the question. And uh, yeah, people do have different views about this. Um, I think uh, another thing that Mr. Zhang said that is also controversial and, and provocative is the reference to, to no separation of powers under the basic law. And I think that's, that is problematic because we see both in the design of the basic law and also in practice, primarily in practice, we do see... Uh, uh, separation of function and separation of persons, um, and uh, and it has to be recognized. I mean, it may not be exactly the same separation of powers that we see in other countries, uh, but we have to admit that under the basic law, courts have the final power of adjudication. No one else can exercise that power. <laughs> Similarly, uh, it's the legislature that has the primary role of lawmaking, uh, and, and the executive leads uh, by reference to policymaking. Right? And these are separate spheres. These are separate functions. Uh, and it, although, I mean, it's interesting that there are instances where there is overlap, where, the, where one, one part of government does exercise other powers of the other part of government, but it's very rare. And in fact, when, those, when this happens, it, it can actually be very controversial. Uh, and so in that way, Hong Kong is unique. Uh, but in, in practice, we do see separation. And that's important because of why we have the principle of separation of powers. Lawrence Ma, uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Hi, thanks very much indeed for joining us. What about that issue of the separation of powers? That's a very clear statement from Jiang Xiaoming that uh, in, in Hong Kong we do not exercise the separation of powers. Uh, but it seems, as Simon Young was saying, day-to-day uh, -day we do exercise the separation of powers, so it's a bit confusing. Yeah, well, I would say that uh, we have a separation of functions, at least, because each branch, of, each branch of government has their own function to exercise. But I guess what Mr. Zhang is emphasizing is that we have an antagonizing uh, two branches of government between the executive and the legislature. Particularly, um, there is lack of cooperation. Uh, Mr. Zhang is not De denying any legislative supervision over the executive government, but there is certainly lack of cooperation, and particularly highlighted by uh, these recent uh, malicious filibustering. I don't think that's what he's saying. He said that Hong Kong is not a system that exercises the separation of powers. Uh, yes, he has quoted um, what Deng Xiaoping has said, that Hong Kong's system of government should not be completely westernized. For example, the separation of three powers and a British or American parliamentary system should not be copied directly in Hong Kong. Actually, yeah, Simon Young? Can I, can I, can oh, I Peter Wong, yeah. Uh, Mr. Lamar. The thing is that uh, we, uh, through the, the discussions uh, the moment ago, is that I think we have got to identify what uh, uh, Director Zhang, he actually says that it is really the separations of the administrative um, uh, functions rather than authority. Now, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that if we, the basic law is part of the uh, constitutional, uh, 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 of the constitution of China, a small part of it, and uh, it is actually uh, related with the, where the, uh, the political uh, authority stem from. Uh, it is really uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a state level, but the Hong Kong within ourselves, we, we are actually just a special administrative region of Hong Kong. So definitely we have the three branches of function, but not the sort of the, the state authority as the uh, constitutional government has. And it is clearly stated in the basic law that the functioning of administration of Hong Kong under these three branches I mean, it's executive-led. It reflects also in many clauses in, in, the, in, in the basic law as well. So I think we've got to separate the levels. When we talk of the constitutional uh, uh, authority and a special administrative region's uh, functions, now, if we see that in that fashion, we, we may see what Director Zhang is uh, trying to explain. Now, I, I have a little the, the difference with uh, Professor Young's uh, 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 the suggestion is that 
between the central government and Hong Kong is a bridging function. It is actually the uh, the, no, that's the, not what the I chief said. executive, it's the chief executive that exercises the bridging. Yes, function. yes, sorry, yeah, they are the chief executive. Uh, it's not bridging. I think that he's actually uh, uh, have certain function and role to see that the central government's authority. This is the authority where our authority comes from uh, as a sovereign part of the, uh, as the sovereign state from of China, and that authority. Uh, has also in the in the uh, basic law has spelled out very clearly, in, especially in the law court. Many of the uh, explanation of the law, especially when it touch on to the question of the of of uh, the, the two system, uh, the final decision lies with the standing committee. So it is there is no two ways about it. Number one, Hong Kong. Yes, uh, we got the high degree of autonomy. And the, our, our, our way of life is preserved. Uh, that really means the legal system, the uh, common law system. But that applies to our civil society. Maybe the civil legislations and uh, uh, criminal law would, would apply as in our uh, the, uh, community and, and it all has been. But when it touches on the constitutional affairs that relates to a state, that is clearly spelled out where the responsibility lies. So I think if we separate that, the, the constitutional authority and also our society's uh, uh, terms of reference, we, it may be clearer to see uh, what Mr. Chen is trying to explain. Uh, can we bring Edward Chin in? He's been on the line waiting patiently. Edward, what is, what is your view on where this discussion has, has brought us so far? Well, I've been following it in the last uh, few days, and I don't represent uh, the legal side of things, but from a business perspective, uh, from hedge funds uh, set up, we uh, are kind of concerned because the way I interpret it is that uh, the chief executive would have a special legal status, transcends the institutions of the executive legislature and the judiciary. So he is like a feudal lord, the way I look at it, right? And uh, with the CY loans, the uh, 50 million uh, UGL case, the bribery case that's still up in the air, uh, you know, it looks like to me he's like a bulletproof monk. You know, there's a movie called The Bulletproof Monk. So, uh, uh, or, you know, like uh, the way I look at it too is that uh, if he is really about the law, you know, the electrical would not have uh, the impeachment procedure of the chief executive, right? Even uh, Donald Dung. Uh, has, is still under investigation by ICAC. So, so this uh, uh, the way he interpreted it, it scares me. That's why back uh, almost two years ago, a bunch of us uh, from the finance and banking sector, we placed an ad uh, in the uh, FT and also Wall Street Journal, uh, addressing it to uh, President Xi Jinping, and also copying Jiang Zemin from the director of the liaison office, talking about. The fair play in Hong Kong is very important, and um, you know, like it's just like uh, they are trying to um, make uh, Hong Kong's uh, core values uh, kind of uh, getting worse and worse. And we could not uh, safeguard the spirit of the rule of law and judicial independence. So that that scared me. I mean, I could be moving uh, to another place where you know common law is practiced. This is a kind of a um, of a big concern. You know, to a lot of business people. Lawrence Ma, how, uh, how do you yeah. address that? Do you think totally, that they should be concerned? I totally disagree, because uh, uh, Edwin must not, must not have read Article 43 of the Basic Law. The chief executive has two roles to play. One is the head of the regional, uh, one of the head of the region. The other is the head of the government. Under Article 43 of the Basic Law, and also under Article 60 of the Basic Law. So what it really boils down to is there are certain powers, like signing bills passed by the Legislative Council uh, to pardon convicts and to dissolve Parliament on deadlock. And all these powers uh, doesn't be usually belong to the head of government. It belongs to the head of region. So the chief executive has, has two roles to play. So now the chief executive was exercising the previous prerogative sovereign power of the crown. And these sort of prerogative sovereign powers have now been doctrinated under basic law in Article 48. 
so whatever the power, the head of region, the chief executive, so whatever power the chief executive is exercising in his capacity as the head of region is already doctrinated under the law. So he's not an emperor, he's not above the law. It, but from Zhang's comments, clearly people are, one, confused, and two, they're concerned. Do you think that either he should clarify or, or someone like uh, the Justice Secretary should clarify so people are not confused anymore? Uh, I think Zhang yes. Ximeng himself should uh, really clarify because it's uh, spoken out from his mouth and also back a few months ago he said he would uh, not comment um, on Hong Kong affairs anymore, right, after they broke down on the motion in mid-June. Uh, but seems like uh, it's not happening. So it, it kind of uh, worries us. <laughs> no, I, think, I, think, I think Mr. Zhang uh, does, does not say that in last May. What he said is that on the political reform issues, but I think that to allow the Hong Kong general public to, to learn a little bit more deeper and broader about the basic law, how Hong Kong is governed, I think that is important. And I think that not only Mr. Zhang or other uh, b- b- people in Hong Kong should explain that. Once now that Mr. Zhang throw the idea out, uh, I think it is a good time for every, even like this in this platform here, we are, we are, we are having different views. No, it's, it's the difference, different of views is okay, as long as we, 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 we deliberate it rationally and let us find out the truth and let the people know. And so I think, I think it's really, really a, a good time that he put these things out. The people just don't need to, uh, I mean, look into with t- too much exaggerations. Like, certainly the CE is not an emperor, as Mr. Ma just uh, explained. You know. uh, does the CE have a position of authority above the judiciary? Peter Wong. Uh, about, I don't think he has the uh, the, the, uh, the right about the ju- judiciary. Well, that's what an executive led. But Zhang, no. that's what Jiang Zhaoming said. No, 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 no. I, I don't think this. This is what he said. He he said in Chi- in Chinese stuff. He has an extraordinary role. It is not above and whatever. Now he has a role more than that. Now, whether above or below or by the side, that is in everybody interpreted. But, but, but there the is point a law is... in our system, at the, at the, at the basic law, governing uh, his uh, administrative uh, authority M- in, I... the, in the SAR. Okay, I haven't seen his comments, I haven't seen his comments uh, in, in Chinese, but the reports <laughs> say uh, Mr. Jiang said the chief executive's position of authority was below the central people's, people's government, but ab- above the three powers in Hong Kong. Well, this is the beauty of the Chinese language. You can interpret in any way, many ways. Chiu no. Yin. Can I, that is really extraordinary. Can I, <laughs> it's yeah. can I pop in? Yep, yes, please. please. The, the, can I say this? The, for example, the, the uh, previous prerogative sovereign powers exercisable by the Crown, say, for example, to dissolve the Parliament and to sign bills, they were not um, doctrinated. So therefore, you can't. Uh, sorry, I don't know this. I don't know this word, doctrinated. I don't know what that means. Can you well, that it? means it has not been written down in the law. So they, the crown, um, the in, yeah, in in the colonial era, would be able to the governor, in, in that regard, would be able to say, for example, dissolve parliament and sign bills or this. And these are not written down in any constitutional documents. It was only contained in a general term in the letters letters, letters patent. But in in. After 1997, after the basic law has been passed and implemented, the chief executive, when exercising all these previous prerogative sovereign powers, would have to exercise them under Article 48 of the basic law, which spells out in very little paragraphs, in many little paragraphs, on how they are to be exercised. Now, if you think about it, people, if, uh, if, if people are not satisfied that the chief executive refused to sign a bill, they can actually go to court and seek judicial review of the um, failure to exercise power under Section Article 48.3, for example, against the chief executive. So in that way, the chief executive is not above the law. No. Okay. All right. (laughs) It's It's very clear in the basic law. I mean, absolutely. Uh, okay, uh, as I say, I think we'd, we'd, we have different ideas about what Zhang Jiaming was, was actually saying. Yeah. Simon Young, can you help us out here? No, not at all, because that's <laughs> precisely the problem. The problem is, what did he say? I, mean, I, mean, this, I think the only lesson that we can take away, and probably what we can all agree upon, 
that when you have a public figure who's going to be making such uh, important statements about uh, the constitutional framework of Hong Kong, uh, and people are going to look at it very closely and debate it, then there should be a very clear public record of that state. I mean, yeah, I mean, Peter in, Wong, in, you in were, both you were, language. Peter Wong, you were saying you were praising the beautiful ambiguity of Chinese, but he shouldn't <laughs> be making beautiful, <laughs> ambiguous statements. It, it's not ambiguous. It's really, I think, that when it says extraordinary, well, it, 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 it plainly covered, is ambiguous it because it was plainly it's plainly been understood one way by by numerous people. No, it covers a lot of things, including above. I, I, that would not say that uh, the uh, uh, C E. Uh, there are no there are no uh, authorities of works uh, that he he he, can, he uh, would have to uh, to to exercise above that of the three administrators. Say for example, if say the uh, standing committee make a decision or, or explanation of some of the controversy issues in Hong Kong, the chief executive would have got to carry it out because he's responsible to the state council, you know, central government. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, go on. Sorry. If you if you read uh, if you care to take out from the LOCPG website, there is this document in nine pages which I printed out yesterday, uh, to read, but of course I can't find the English version of it. Uh, okay, <laughs> from your understanding so this is the document this is because this was these were comments made during a seminar, was it? So the, the, the document is is a transcript of that or something? No, it is actually a full speech. It's okay. a nine pages full speech. Right. Okay. And, and is it your understanding from reading that that he was not saying that the the chief executive uh, was had any sort of position of authority above the uh, executive, leg legislative, and judicial branches? Um, uh, um, uh, he, what he said is um, he is the the chief executive is the head of the region and he's also the head of the executive, and it also explained in many in four paragraphs about the constitutional system in Hong Kong, um, the position of the chief executive in this constitutional system, and the relationship between the... Sorry, Mr. Ma, no, my question is, did, did he say that the, the chief executive has a position of authority above the other branches? Above the branches? Yes, y yes he did. He did he say did. that? Well, Peter Wong, you just said he didn't say that. No, 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 no. Well, I, let, 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 please, let, let's put in a proper context. The thing is that in the, uh, within our SAR in Hong Kong, there's a certain... Uh, Peter Wong, uh, did, he say, did, the, did he say that the chief executive holds a position of authority above the executive, legislative and judicial branches? Well, in the, all the discussions here, I separate two levels. I separate the, his authority two levels. One is at the local and SAR level. The other is that he has a role in the... We're not talking about your views or we're talking <laughs> about the reality. We're talking about what no, no, General Chairman said. The did General Chairman say that or did he not say that? No, no, he, he say it in the context. I was trying to explain that in the context of the Hong Kong SAR, uh, he certainly have got to comply. He has no role up above it. But the thing is that from the role of the uh, state government, when there is a certain uh, uh, explanation or position made by the state, he has to carry out. But I mean, the, the, correct, the, if, there, if there are any mistakes or, or there are controversy between the local legislation and the explanation from the standing committee. So on that context, he certainly has a role about that the three administrative regions. So basic, basically... If it touches on the issue of constitution... They're saying that he doesn't unless he does. I mean, it's, it's totally contradictory. No, no, no. If you, if, if you separate it in two levels to see it that way, I don't think it's... Contradictory. In Hong Kong, we've been running a, the, the common law in the in our, in our civil society, and those still apply uh, in, after 1997. And I don't think right. he breached on that. But the thing is that when there are controversies between the central government and the and the Hong Kong, the uh, like uh, like at the present moment, I think uh, all the legal professions, including the they believe that Hong Kong is run by uh, common law, which I say it is no. It is run by basic law, in, but the common law plays an important part of it. I think that is one thing that uh, the legal 
the legal community in Hong Kong uh, has the big difference on. All right, let's see. We if we are run clear... by basic law, not only just the common law. All right, let's see if we can clarify a little bit after the news uh, at, uh, at nine sure. o'clock for uh, three minutes. We will say goodbye at the moment to uh, Edward Chin. Uh, if you've got questions or comments, uh, then uh, drop us a line. Back chat at rthk.hk. Maybe there's something you want clarified. The weather forecast: sunny periods with maximum temperature about thirty-one degrees, with one or two rain patches later. The outlook cloudy, uh, with a few rain patches in the next couple of days. Twenty-seven degrees now. Humidity seventy-six percent. Has needed a united team to negotiate the terms of the latest bailout with the country's European creditors. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Welcome back. This is Back Chat on a Tuesday morning with Karen Coe and me, Hugh Chiverton, uh, as your host. We're continuing to uh, reflect on Zheng Xiaoming's comments over the weekend, over the separation of powers and the role of the chief executive uh, under the basic law uh, in Hong Kong. We have with us, helping us out to sort things out, Professor Simon Young from the uh, Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong, Professor and Associate Dean Research, uh, Lawrence Ma, who's Chairman of the China-Australia Legal Exchange Foundation, and NPC Delegate Peter Wong. Our email address is backchat at rthk. HK. Later, we're also going to be talking about child abuse cases uh, in Hong Kong. Is there a case for mandatory reporting, perhaps by schools, to the police if they suspect, suspect uh, child abuse is uh, occurring? If you want to comment on that, then uh, drop us a line. Call us, 233-88266. Or you can go to our Facebook page, which is Backchat on RTHK Radio 3. OK, some comments from Henry. Uh, quite a few comments from Henry on our, on our Facebook page. Um, Let's take this one. Uh, Zhang Xiaoming's comments, detailed comments, reflect the first step in tackling the problems arising from Occupy Central, how to address the problem from a constitutional view. Inasmuch as the chief executive is the only connection between Hong Kong and the central government, logically his is the person responsible to the central government for Hong Kong's judiciary, executive and legislative functions. Uh, In this regard, he could be seen over and above. But equally, there are checks and balances. Say, if the CE is unreasonably overriding each and every act passed by legislation, LegCo can vote him down. Hong Kong never has a separation of power as in the US. Uh, Even the UK does not have separation of power. Uh, His article also reinforces the executive-led nature of the Hong Kong government. To say the chief executive now has the power of an emperor is an overblown exaggeration and is a fallacy. Hong Kong people are reasonable people. The central government is also responsible and this emperor exaggeration could apply to almost each and every head of state. Uh, recent Ta Kung Pao has art- articles carrying detailed explanations on issues in Jung's statement on separation of power, constitutional issues, how to tackle the weak governance in Hong Kong, etc. Uh, I have no political stand, but frankly, I find their arguments coherent, consistent and logically tight, uh, says Henry. Thank you very much indeed for, for those comments. Um, uh, Simon Young, Professor Young. Um, is that a good uh, summary of the uh, the role of the chief executive, that uh, he is responsible to the central government for the judiciary, the executive and the legislature? He could be seen as over and above in that re- regard, but also there are checks and balances on him. As I said at the beginning, I don't think the hierarchical uh, description is helpful. Um, I mean, why over and above? Um, I mean, I certainly uh, I'd agree that there's, there's a special role. Uh, and I think well, because he, because he, it's executive led, the leader suggests above. Well, executive led may may refer to uh, a temporal thing that they lead, but then you need uh, ultimately you need if you're passing laws the the approval of the legislature, right? And then of course you have the the courts that do serve as a check on the executive. Um, so I think it's in regard to matters that deal with the central and the Hong Kong government that the uh, the chief executive has a special role. And as I described before, it's a, it's a bridging role. And I, I know Peter uh, has uh, uh, expressed a uh, disagreement with that, but I think when one looks closely at the basic law and the actual operation of the basic law, uh, one sees that bridging role in practice. Um, look, take, for example, uh, when uh, we want to have national laws, Chinese laws uh, enacted in Hong Kong, that's Annex 3 of the basic law. It's the chief executive that has to ultimately promulgate uh, these matters. Uh, and also, when there are matters that touch upon Hong Kong's external affairs or foreign affairs, again, it's it's through the chief executive uh, that that that, Hong Kong, that the central government uh, issues the uh, instructions, and it's through the, tech, uh, the chief executive that they get implemented. Right. So it's a very important role when when we're concerned with uh, these matters that cross the two jurisdictions. Uh, but when it comes to purely Hong Kong affairs, purely Hong Kong affairs. 
it, it does, it's, it's, it's unhelpful to talk about the chief executive uh, having some uh, role over and above the other spheres of government. Uh, because it, when it's purely Hong Kong affairs, in, in many ways, we operate like in other uh, uh, jurisdictions that have a separation of powers. And, and that's exactly why the courts, in several judgments, the chief executive, uh, sorry, the chief justice, has referred to separation of powers being reflected in the basic law. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important thing to note. Uh, and um, I think, you know, of course, when, when uh, uh, the Chinese side, the mainland side of mainland officials, say that there is no separation of power, of course, they are looking at it from their perspective. They're looking at it uh, when it comes to matters that concern the relationship between the central government and the regional government. And so that explains why they, they, they put it in those terms. But when it's purely Hong Kong matters, right, the courts have the final power of adjudication. Right? The, the chief executive cannot overturn that. They've got to accept that, and that's the rule of law. Unless you, unless you don't accept the rule of law, right, then, then there is separation there. And similarly, you know, when, you know, when uh, the legislature passes uh, a law, uh, yes, there are exceptional cases when uh, the chief executive can refuse to promulgate it and can even dissolve the legislature. Those are your checks and balances, right? and, and they're, all, they're all in the basic law. But, but uh, beyond that, it, it, it has... Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, the power of, of legislation. The legislature has the power to legislate. So, Professor Young, then it, it would seem that um, maybe the the timing of these comments is really is really more to do with what's happening happening politically, domestically, with the approaching anniversary of Occupy Central, as that Facebook commenter suggests. That it's more really a reminder uh, or a perhaps a warning to Hong Kong to behave yourselves? Perhaps, but I think it's also useful to just uh, put it in proper perspective because when one goes back and looks at uh, some of the writings of uh, Chinese scholars and, and those who were involved in the drafting of the basic law, it's actually not too different. What Mr. Zhang is saying now is not too different from what was said back then. Um, and there's a very famous work by Mr. Xiao Wei Yun. Uh, who has written about uh, the drafting of the basic law. Uh, and he says very similar things, that we, we do not uh, uh, adopt or replicate uh, Western-style separation of powers, that, that our system is unique. Um, and, uh, and, of course, there, there's a strong emphasis on this idea of mutual cooperation, uh, that the, the different branches of government should cooperate. Now, that, of course, is the vision. That was the vision of behind the basic law. We can now look back and, and ask ourselves, have we realized that? Have we realized that cooperation? And people have different views about that. Um, so in many ways, the things that we're hearing now uh, aren't really too different from what's been said before. But as I tried to explain before, you know, this is the perspective from the Chinese government. Of course, they are very concerned about matters of the state and, and the relation between the central and the regional. Uh, but uh, we here, of course, um, you know, in our daily lives, we're concerned more with, with the region, with what's happening on the ground. And, and in that respect, as I said, it's separation of powers, and separation of persons, and separation of functions, and there's, and there's no interference. I mean, P Peter Wong, separation of powers, of course, is, is, is not the way that things work on the mainland. Uh, in fact, uh, it's illegal on the mainland. In fact, uh, um, Liu Xiaobo is in prison partly because he advocate, even advocated uh, the separation of powers. It's completely anathema to the way that the party uh, works uh, in China, as you know. So uh, they certainly don't have it here. But it looks like we do have it in, in, in Hong Kong. You look at the relationship between, yeah, between the chief executive and, and LegCo. The chief executive can dissolve LegCo, uh, but LegCo doesn't have to pass uh, law. Uh, at the behest of the uh, chief executive. Of course, we just saw that, as Stephen points out on our Facebook page, uh, with the uh, reform package. He asks if the C does have overriding power. Why didn't he exercise it to re adopt the reform package that LegCo rejected? Uh, what I'm saying is that th that's an obvious ca case of check and balance, isn't it? That the executive can't has limited powers to override uh, legislative, legislative council, and the legislative council has some powers to, to override the chief executive. That is a check and balance. Yeah, I, I think that Nobody dispute that uh, as far as it comes into the civil administration in Hong Kong. These are practices we have been practicing. And I think what Director Chow refers to is really the essence on the constitutional aspect when it touches on the, the two systems. And that's why I said that uh, Professor Young earlier said I 
Actually, I, 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 but I, I, I don't think I don't think he's talking about the two systems. He's no, talking no, no, about no, the Hong me, Kong me, system. He's talking about within the Hong Kong system, the chief executive is above the the three branches. Well, when he said that he has two roles, one role is that he has got to govern. That's why when I when I say that, uh, what prof, uh, the director Jung talk about the, the the word of extraordinary. At one point, at his two role, one role when he is taking the, the directives from the central the government, he certainly is above the SAR uh, from the state uh, perspective. But on the other hand, when he is running Hong Kong, I think he is still subject to the functions, the three functions that which we always have. And it has always been like that. Now, the, I think one of the point that, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why the central government through Director Zhang, I mean, expressed uh, the, the the latest statement uh, regarding the role of the uh, of the sea is that look in the past uh, eighteen months in Hong Kong, I mean our landscape and politically economically have changed. Now there are certain uh, I think uh, uh, revelations revisions which are Hong Kong we have got to do some soul searching. Now uh, each of us I think we try to deliberate what's wrong. <laughs> Our economy, our, uh, our social community have changed so drastically from the past. So I think seeing H- how what's has our economy here, changed, how that's our... why we have got to learn more about what is it in the basic law. I think that has always been going on. That maybe the basic law, uh, uh, the spirit at its essence, has not been really uh, fully propagated in Hong Kong. And I think the, one of the key points that uh, the central government, through the liaison office, uh, start uh, deliberating on some of the some of the, the, the details in the basic law, and this is one of them. Okay, here's his comment from uh, Tom. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Tom. Uh, who says uh, the spectre raised of our chief executive wearing the emperor's robes is a bit disturbing. More disturbing, however, is whether the organs of government have understood this to be the case all along. Could one ask, in view of Elsie Lung's present position and her previous Justice Department job, whether the chief executive of the time had any say in the non-prosecution of Sally Orr? Another interesting appointment is of uh, Elsie's compatriot Tam Wai Chu as chair of ICAC. Maybe the question is not the wording of the basic law, but who you appoint to where. Note appointments to the Hong Kong U Council. Uh, any role for Fanny Law? Question asks uh, Tom and says, by the way, congrats to Barry Chung, ex exco, uh, for successfully showing remorse for non payment of wages. Uh, is that like robbery and being let out of prison? Don't hold your breath about Donald Jung's case. When was that investigation started? Uh, says Tom. And uh, one more comment, uh, let's see, uh, from Alex, uh, who says, uh, root problems. I turned on radio to hear, this is the beauty of Chinese language, quote, this is the beauty of Chinese language you can interpret in many ways, unquote. Everything is what we are told until we are told something different. You know my talkings? Uh, says Alex. Thank you very much indeed for, for that uh, comment, uh, Alex. Um, Lawrence Ma, um, I don't know. In some ways, it's very, very simple, isn't it? Like I said, on, on the mainland, the party tells the tells judges and tells the judiciary uh, what to do, and we don't do that in Hong Kong. That's a separation of powers. Um, I, I, for, for the first part of that statement, I, I tend to disagree, because although um, judges are party members, true, but for individual case decisions judges have to make the decisions according to law it is not a matter where the party secretary can ring the judge on the phone and tell him how to make his decision that is not the case now as far as i understand um they do have judges do have a political view which are aligned with the party's view but that does not mean that judges will have to make decisions against parties. And in many cases, as I see, there are judicial decisions making, uh, judges making decisions against um, uh, companies which are also run by the party. So uh, that probably answer reply to your first part, the first part of your question. The second part of the question, yes, Hong Kong, we have a very independent judiciary um, which exercises its power independently. And according to, as I agree with uh, Simon Yang, that judges, uh, they do have the Hong, Hong Kong judges to have the f- uh, uh, power of final adjudication. 
OK, some interesting comments here from Bowen. Thank you very much indeed, Bowen, and an email, uh, who says, uh, Dear Backchat, Jung's comments on such an overwhelming, impo- overwhelmingly important uh, topic as the one under discussion is a perfect example of the problem with the Chinese system. Under the basic law and the Chinese system, the authority of interpreting the basic law rests with the MPC Standing Committee and our law courts. What Jiang did was to expound on the meaning of the basic law, and that amounts to interpreting it. Yet he's just an official of the Chinese liaison office. The same problems happened many times before. Last year, in issuing the white paper on the meaning of one country, two systems, the news department of the state council did the same thing. Going back in time, it seems that that anybody relatively senior in the Chinese government feels he is competent to interpret the basic law. By the way, this phenomenon was harshly criticised by La Mong Hong Dream Bear last night on uh, another radio station. Uh, Peter Wong, are you concerned about that? Well, uh, I think, the, like I said, it has always been now in the Hong Kong the major controversy between, if we are talking of a political stance, it's not the uh, anti-government or the pro-government. We are seeing that uh, if one takes a political uh, perspective, any statement made by the, the SAR government the, the chief executive or the liaison office chief or even some officials back in China uh, or any deeds they've done, any statement they make has been highly critical. I mean, like say, for example, like we are talking of the um, uh, it's, it's really be, uh, the CE the C becoming an emperor is over, totally over exaggerated. I, 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 this is what we face with in Hong Kong nowadays. When we argue on an issue, it's really, uh, b- b- really out, out, uh, out of bound uh, in, in some of the suggestions. But Peter Wong, this is slightly different. I mean, this is at a at a, a conference on the basic law for him to come and say that the chief executive possesses a special legal position. That's that's not just some idle comment. That's something that people want to know exactly. What do you mean? Because well, clearly a lot uh, of people have never heard that yeah, before. Okay, uh, Karen, it's not, he, he hasn't said that he has an, a special legal position. Actually, he just said that he has an extraordinary role. Now, at a certain time, yes, when he carry out the central government's uh, uh, directives, uh, he certainly, that is about, that is from the state to a special administrative region. But on the other hand, when he is administering Hong Kong affairs, he is still subject to Hong Kong's uh, but three functional uh, uh, administrative uh, structures. I mean, the, all, all the, the, the ground the ground rules of that. So I think that on one, is, you cannot say that it's above. At the same time, in Hong Kong, he has got to live with what our Hong Kong system. I mean, uh, impede on him. So that is why I said the extraordinary is not only just above. When people say that he's become an emperor, he at the same time he has got to subject. I mean, to the to the to the to the ground rules in Hong Kong. OK, uh, some more comment from uh, our Facebook page. Thanks. Denny says, central government officials need to learn the art of public relations. Just because it's true doesn't mean you have to air it at that, in that way. Uh, Hong Kong, both during the colonial and SAR eras, never had separation of powers, at least in respect to executive and legislative branches. Right now, all meaningful legislations have to come from the government. Legico members can only propose non-binding resolutions that don't concern finance and constitutional affairs. If it's truly separate branches of government, only Legico members can propose legislation legislation and the executive would only be responsible for carrying out those legislations. This is why I find the term legislator such a misnomer in English programmes such as this one. Uh, my biggest issue with Jiang Xiaoming's comment is how separation of powers only applies to sovereign states. Uh, every state in the United States has three branches of government independent from each other. You're entitled to your opinion but not your own facts. Uh, more importantly, this is why I find people like Ronnie Tong and other so-called moderate pan-democrats attempts at, to re-engage Beijing to be futile. They want you to cave in, but they don't budge. Uh, and uh, Rod says, uh, if the law is up for interpretation, then there is still no law. And uh, one more comment from uh, our Facebook page. Uh, Drake says, I heard uh, th- with the subject line, uh, problem, what's pure Hong Kong affairs? Uh, Drake says, I heard someone mentioning that, but pure Hong Kong affairs change over time. Uh, People's Daily, March 1993. Lu Ping, head of the Macau and Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office. Uh, how Hong Kong develops its democracy in the future is completely within the sphere of the autonomy of the Hong Kong. The central government will not interfere. That's what Le, Lu Ping said back in 1993, and I guess uh, things have changed um, since then. Um, so... Uh, so Simon Young, I mean, what has been, do you think, the effect, finally, of, of, of Zhang Xiaoming's comments? Well, I think 
we haven't fully seen them. I think we continue to debate this. Um, I, mean, I think uh, it would be useful if there was an English version of the, uh, the speech so that uh, a wider audience can, can read it and, and, and reflect upon it. But I think um, it would be useful uh, to see if there were references back to show that uh, this is not the first time that these ideas are being expressed. Uh, if, it's, if it's a document that's well sourced, the previous speeches, then you can see very clearly that it, it's a uh, uh, a very similar tenor that's coming from the central government. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think these uh, uh, discussions are valuable, but I think we have to uh, not lose sight of um, the uh, purpose of separation of powers. Uh, we seem to be treating it almost like a sacred cow. Uh, and I think one has to go back and reflect upon, uh, you know, why, why do we have separation of powers in the first place? And I think it has to go back to this idea of, uh, uh, so that the accumulation of power in, in one branch uh, may lead to abuse uh, or tyranny. Um, and, and hence, if that's the ultimate uh, aim, uh, th that's what I think we need to focus on. Um, and, and that's uh, you know, how we should be developing our system uh, to, to try to prevent and, and to avoid these kinds of problems that we're, where there is abuse of power. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Simon Young from the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law, Professor and uh, Associate Dean of Research there. Uh, thanks to uh, Peter Wong, NPC Delegate, and uh, thanks to Lawrence Ma, Chairman of the China Australia Legal Exchange Foundation. And uh, we're going to give the last word, uh, I think, on this occasion to uh, Alex, uh, who's back, who says, whatever Wong says, why not uh, Cheng say in the first place what Wong says now is what Cheng meant? I do not know Wong's talkings. That's Peter Wong he's referring to. Uh, Alex, thank you very much indeed uh, for those uh, comments. And uh, once again, if you want to uh, continue the debate, you can go to our Facebook page, which is Backchat on RTHK Radio 3, uh, if there's anything you, you want to uh, talk to there. I wanted to turn finally today to um, the uh, case uh, that's uh, emerged recently of a uh, seven-year-old girl who's uh, apparently, it seems, been uh, suffering from uh, uh, appalling abuse over over a, a period of time, uh, a period of time uh, perhaps in which there were opportunities to uh, report um, this abuse and uh, to bring it to uh, to the attention of the uh, authorities. We're joined on the line now uh, by Fernando Chung, who uh, is suggesting one uh, remedy or one uh, approach to reduce the incident, this kind of incident uh, in future. Uh, he's a legislator with the Labour Party. Mr Chung, good morning to you. Good morning, Hugh and Karen. Uh, Karen. You, you suggested uh, basically uh, a compulsory reporting or mandatory reporting uh, w where child abuse is, is suspected. Is that right? And, and who, who would oh, yes. do it to who? Yes. Um, usually these type of abuse happen over a period of time. And the most common place that could be detected, uh, this type of abuse could be detected, is the school. Because uh, whether, you know, if the child is not at home, uh, he or she is most likely um, in school. And teachers, if they do pay attention, uh, would have the uh, most chance to detect these type of abuses. And uh, this particular case, we understand that the kindergarten uh, actually noticed uh, some of the injuries that the girl suffered and started inquiring about these um, uh, bruises and, and injuries uh, with the parent, and then the parent uh, decided to withdraw, and that was the end of it. And that's very unfortunate uh, because although we do have guidelines, uh, as it is, the social welfare department has issued guidelines to uh, various types of institutions, including kindergarten, basically requiring them to uh, report these suspected child abuse cases. However, the uh, guideline has no legal uh, uh, authority and it's not legally binding. And therefore, I think it, it's important for us to consider uh, introducing a mandatory reporting uh, law that would require professionals such as teachers, social workers, and medical professions uh, to report suspected child abuse case to um, authorities. To, to, sorry, to the police or social welfare or, or who? Well, if it is a suspected case, uh, there is um, uh, perhaps no strong indication of um, criminal element. Uh, they start with social welfare mm. department. And if there are, uh, according to professional judgment, that there might be criminal elements involved, 
then uh, the cases should be reported to to the police. Um, Mr. Chung, I guess two concerns spring to my mind with something like that. One is, are teachers uh, at any level, one, equipped and really qualified to to know uh, when they should be reporting and what they should re- be reporting? And two, are schools likely to want to take this on, especially if there is a uh, some sort of legal requirement? Well, um, the teachers should receive training on um, detection and prevention of child abuse, and uh, I think it is uh, very relevant because really teachers are quite likely to come across these situations, um, and and they should be the first one to know. And well, yes, it does increase the uh, responsibility of the teachers, if you will. But whether this law exists. There are already guidelines uh, that requiring them to do so. Uh, the problem with this guideline is that it really has no power. Uh, and when the, um, uh, the withdrawal happened, then it seems that relationship terminated, and, and therefore there is no more any responsibilities on the part of the school. But we're not looking at uh, you know responsibilities or professional liability. We're talking about protection of children's safety and life in some cases. And I think this is an important uh, uh, point to raise, and it will really raise the awareness and alertness of uh, helping professionals that uh, we should report these situations as soon as possible, and that there is no what about the danger of the, of the schools? Uh, the, the schools. Perhaps. What about the danger yeah. of the schools fearing the consequences and, and, and over-reporting, just being too quick, basically, to report this because they think that they might be, they might, uh, you know, be punished well, under, the, under the law. This should be handled by um, a specialist, te- uh, specialized team uh, at the social welfare department, and currently they do have such. Uh, provision. There is a unit called Family and Child Protective Service Unit, and they specialize in domestic violence. So um, if these cases are false alarms, the, the unit should be able to detect them and uh, stop the uh, problem right there. Do you think maybe um, this is something that the education department needs to work on more to provide adequate training to either teachers or if the school is fortunate enough to have counsellors um, for them to be looking for this kind of problem? Absolutely. Uh, I think teachers should be able to provide uh, sufficient training and that uh, schools, if equipped with counsellors, uh, and many, most of them are equipped with social workers, and they could also be the first line in uh, making assessments as to whether these uh, are suspected child abuse cases. Okay, well, Fernando Chan, we're out of time. Thank you very much indeed for, for joining us today, Le- uh, legislator with the Labour Party. Karen, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Thank uh, you. Interesting programme today. With the, here's the weather forecast just before we go. Sunny periods forecast for today. Temperatures up to about 31 degrees with a couple of rain patches later. Moderate to fresh easterly wind, occasionally strong offshore. And the outlook is going to be cloudy with a few rain patches expected over the next couple of days. At the moment, 27 Celsius and the relative humidity is now at 74%. The Capacity Building Mileage Program provides a wide variety of courses for women who are interested in lifelong learning. Students are empowered to face challenges in daily life with a positive mindset, which enables them to lead a more fruitful life. Courses taught in English and Putonghua are now available. For program details, please call 2915-2380. Nine thirty two, the news now with Samantha Butler. EU ministers have failed to reach an agreement on proposals to relocate 120,000 refugees across the continent. At the end of the meeting, officials tried to put on a brave face on the divisions that now threaten Europe's open borders. 